loser. It's your one and only son. I'm not home. Oh, come on. It's kind of cold out here. How you doing, Pop? What the hell are you doing here? I came to see you. What do you think I'm doing here? I told you not to come around here no more. I come all the way from Brooklyn. And that's how you treat me? You can make it back by 11. It's just one bridge away. Hey, the place doesn't look so bad. I pay a girl almost $50 a day. It better not look bad. She hot? <laughs> she cleans the turn and mop the floor. What do I care what she looks like? Well, it's nice to have something to look at, right? <laughs> well, you don't have beer in Brooklyn? Why, well, I can't have a beer? 10 o'clock in the morning. It's night time for me. I'm working those late shifts at the school. That's right. I almost forgot. You're a janitor. Shit throwing out shit. You know, I can knock you out with one punch. Big deal. So could a Girl Scout. Come on, Pop. I'm trying to talk to you. We don't talk anymore. The hell do you think you're doing? Get the hell out of my house now! I'm not going anywhere. You hear me? Why? You need more money? You want to wait till I fall asleep again so you can take more money? Yeah! You didn't think I knew about that. Oh, come on, Pop. Whatever it was, I was going to pay you back. You're a bum, Mikey. Bums don't pay back. They just end up taking more money. And that's your problem. All you ever want is more. It's just a few bucks. What about after you divorce? You stayed here more than a year. A grown man staying with his parents. You said you'd help. Till you get back on your feet. So I got back on my feet. You're still dragging your feet, Mikey. Up and down my doorstep, up and down my stairway. You're supposed to be my father. Will fathers help their sons? I always helped you. I sent you to college so you'd be different from me. Better. I couldn't keep up. I'm sorry I ain't no Einstein. I worked my ass off. Banging nails, lifting buckets in the hot sun, freezing my balls off during the winter time. And for what? So you can keep on taking from me? You know what? Forget I came by. I try to forget, but you keep on coming back. What's your problem, Pop? Why don't you just come out and say it? Why don't you come right out and say why you're here? Is this it? Is this what you want? I don't want your money. You want me to go take a nap? You can take it without me seeing. Just a few bucks. You stole everything from me. You stole the love of my life from me. What? You let it die. What are you talking about? It was just another seizure. You were used to seeing them. She had them since you were a kid! Yeah, but this was a bad one. 
Remember what the ambulance guy said? There was nothing I could do. It was just like all the others. But this time she choked. I showed you a long time ago, Mikey. I showed you how sometimes you gotta hold a tongue down. So she wouldn't choke, I know. Yeah, that's it. But you don't remember how. You know why? Oh, come on, Pop. You're a grown man in your 30s staying with his parents. The least you could have done was save your mother from dying. But you couldn't because you were too drunk. You're blaming Mama dying on me? It's not my fault. I, I, I panicked. That, that's all. I, I panicked. Pop, you gotta believe me. I don't believe stinking drunken liars. I love Mama too, you know. You think it's been easy for me all these years and now you think it's my fault? I called 911. It's not my fault. They weren't here on time. You were supposed to know what to do. Like I said, I panicked, Pop. I panicked. <laughs> you want to know why I'm here, Pop? I'm here because I need you. I'm sick and they say I can die. I need you, Pop. I need you.
Holy Massachusetts. We're, we're on the top of Hog Mountain in Holly, Massachusetts. I was going to get the farm a Cornish name, so I looked at the surroundings. It could have been Clodgy, which is stony and muddy road, but I thought Tregellis Hidden Homestead was more fitting. Then it's always fun to see how it's pronounced and the fact that we get called Mr. and Mrs. Tregellis. Tregelli. Nobody says Tregellis. When you go in and feed a bunch of animals, you know you've done good because they're happy to see you. They're glad, they're satisfied, you give them the hay, you clean the water, they've yelled at you the moment you woke up and knew that you're, they heard your footsteps. The sound of chomping and ruminants, and it's just wonderful. There's nothing nicer than being in the barn when they're all lying down and chewing their cud. It's like listening to a heartbeat. It really is a good feeling here. It, 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 it's, it's on a ley line, you can feel it. You can mm. feel the compassion actually in this place when you come here. Okay, my name is Edward Cothy. What do I do? I don't know. I'm a photographer. I travel to the Philippines. My name is Jody. I'm known as Jody. I'm Jody Cothy. I'm married to Ed. I'm also known as a putt occasionally as Pamela Stewart, which is my writing name, which is poetry, not the person who writes the horror stories. I grew up with dogs. I had some cats when I moved to apartment life and I adored them. But I had absolutely no, and I was horse crazy as a kid, absolutely nuts, you know, like the typical girl. Uh, but I had no experience. Ed was the person who had experience. I grew up in Cornwall and uh, my brother-in-law had a farm, I had friends that had farms, so I grew up milking cows, I grew up with beef cattle, I grew up with pigs, and I just grew up being with animals. This is an indoor rescue bird. Eventually, if he gets very excited, he'll throw up on me. We built it as something we were able to have an interest together and something to care about something together. We create a history. We created a history for the place as the farm grew and developed and slowed down and did all the sort of normal things that a life does. And we created a history for our, within our marriage that we went through a process and are still going through it. I came in from the boat. I used to be a fisherman. There's hotels in my hometown at St. Ives in Cornwall. And I used to supply them with fish for the restaurant. And I went in and one of my friends come over and say, hey, I want you to meet my friend from America. So I said, hello. And I said, what's your name? She said, Jody. And I said, what do you do? She said, I'm a poet. So I said, tell me a poem. And she couldn't. <laughs> No, I couldn't. 
now, because I don't memorize my poetry, and I should. It's probably a good idea. But I went, I had a Guggenheim, and I traveled to Cornwall to look up Arthurian sites, which I actually didn't do. I actually spent most of my time in pubs and wandering around and looking at things. But I met him in this after hours uh, bar in the hotel. When I shook his hand, I felt this current of warmth go up my right arm. And that was how it all started. We met in, I don't know, we met 1982. Then we married when I returned to England in 83, and we lived there for seven years. We came to the States in 1990 and lived in Montague, an absolutely wonderful house. And Ed did some landscape gardening, and then he became sick with what was considered chronic fatigue or whatever catch-all phrase they had for a real a couple of real years of real problems. And then one day he said, oh, I want animals. Let's go have a farm. And I thought, oh, please. So we started looking at farms. And we had at that time three dogs and a number of cats. And so we wanted a place where dogs could run. And we wanted privacy. And we were shown this place even though it was on the market. And the people who owned this place at that time took to us and our sense of wanting to have a farm. And so it all melded and worked out. You have such a big neck. Yes, I know. It's very hard to get through here. It's like being in a zoo. Clearly I have a camel, a couple of donkeys, a large number of sheep, or at least about 40, I think. Many dogs, nine dogs, two cats, uh, four goats, one alpaca named Wallace Phillip, and um, about five llamas, I would say, by now, don't you think? And, oh, let's see, about eight pigs, one peacock, one old turkey, ducks, geese, and an emu. That covered everything? Yaks. Yaks and a couple of cows and some yak cow cross. You could sit and talk about all the good times and all the silly things that animals do. But one thing when you care for other lives is you learn an awful lot about death. Mm. And you learn, you know, you hear the old people in, in the tribes all over the world talking about good deaths and bad deaths. You really come to understand, and you really come to understand compassion. And I think because I had so much compassion for my animals is what drew me to Buddhism. They teach you a true life lesson. And for me personally, I can look up into a field and I can look at an animal and I can tell you if he's got a bruise on his big toe of his right leg. I do a lot of fair trade, or I have done a lot of fair trade work all over the world, and I, I did a lot working with Tibetan people in Nepal and India. Now I'm actually working with families in the Philippines. And again, what is giving me the strength to sit down with a family that has absolutely nothing? A, a tin shack, if they're very lucky, and the mother is is very, very ill or dying with tuberculosis. You got a premature baby there you know is going to die. You have dirty drinking water, no sanitary conditions. But the people are happy. They don't know when their food is coming next. They're so happy. And I think I help them out as much as I can, sometimes with money, some, a lot of times with deeds. But I think learning from the animals, learning the compassion from the animals, is what's given me the strength to actually work with people. Send Britney Spears to a farm. God willing, after 13 months, she'll have a different perspective on life because she'll see what matters and she'll see what she can survive and she can see. And you can get your hands dirty, you can cherish life, you can help support it, you can feed. Feeding animals is so much fun because they're always really pleased about it. Hello. 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 When you have somebody's life in your hands, no, that's it doesn't easy. matter if it's a pig or a chicken, you care for that animal. And actually, I talk to my animals all the time, and they respond and they understand. It's been like constant graduate school to have animals all the time how to give an injection, how to tube a baby, how to fail, how to live with death. 
you just become more sensitive and thoughtful in different ways. Now that I'm doing less farm work, I really, really miss that. You're probably 90, 96, 97. And that's when all the fiber business began to burgeon and, and began to learn to weave. We moved to the farm in 94. So we have been here 18 years from two days ago. The natural dye studio had started to function and build up and the dyer was named Jody McKenzie, who was quite a well-known fiber person. Things developed to have more of an interest in the Tibetan culture and the Asian cultures and the Buddhism and the stupa got built and things shifted away from the fiber into something that involved a connection, a global connection with the rest of the world. In our road that we traveled, I think I could honestly say that we started off thinking that we was going to make money and then we just <laughs> fell in love with the animals and then it didn't care about the money. It's a funny dimension to go back and think about, would I do this again? Sure, and I can say, oh, I do this different, I do this different. But every single experience, for good or ill, builds up everything that you are and the world you live in. I can't imagine leaving this place, but I also have no idea what I would do with it because it's quite a big thing. But I can't, I couldn't go into a town and not have a some of each animal. I mean, I'd have to have an ark house. I honestly don't see what's next at all. Do you? You have to go somewhere warm. I have to go somewhere warm because of my health. I have chosen the Philippines because, well, the one thing with my nerve problem is I cannot be near a fan, I cannot be near any sort of wind if it's a cold wind. I discovered that the Philippines there, where the wind is hot, my pain goes away. And the problem with my pain is no doctor's ever been able to take it away from me. They've tried narcotics, everything. It does not work. The pain is unbearable. I know I'm going to end up living there eventually. I, I've just spent seven weeks there. I just ripped a cartilage in my knee in a mango forest, 100-year-old mango forest, taking pictures of the uh, a, a mangrove snake. Now, I will go there. I have families that I've been helping for years. I, I have old, old friends. But the problem is my wife cannot go there because she cannot take I the heat or the humidity. Heat. We don't know what we're going to do. We'll figure uh, out something, we figure. We uh, know we're going to leave, whether it be by death or whatever. Someday. someday. Yeah, I'm not yeah. I mean, it's soon. not going to be quarter past three on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> it's going to be some part of our life. But I, I really hope that we've left a very good fingerprint on this land and on the animals living and dead we have protected the land so nobody can build on it so our woods will stay woods forever our fields will stay fields forever we just hope that when we do make the decision to move on that we can find the right people that will care as much as we care for it because it's something very very special here there we go. There she is. She's fine. She's fine. Okay. And then I'm going to put her down and they can run away. Not be so scared. That's a girl. Yeah. Oh, look at her nursing. How cool is that? Good mommy. She's a great mom.